Hi and welcome to the My Future Business Show. My name's Rick Nusky and today I'm sitting with Phil Singleton of Kansas City Web Design. How are you? Good, how are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, thank you, not too bad. Uh, thank you for coming on the My Future Business Show today with us and, uh, and sharing a little bit of your expertise. So uh, what's happening in Phil's world? Um, you know, just kind of going through the grind. I've got, um, we've got, I've got a book that I wrote with a guy, John Jantz, who wrote Duct Tape Marketing last year, and that's kind of um, enabled me to basically scale my business out a little bit, which is essentially, I guess I would consider myself my core business being a web designer. Yep. Yep. Um, although, you know. Um, that's just because I think where you need to focus and that's kind of the hub of every, where everything is these days. Yeah. Uh, my true interest really is I think in, in lead generation and I'm especially passionate about search engine optimization, specifically getting Google, you know, so people can, can rank highly and get, um, get that visibility so they get a chance to get a click and then perhaps a phone call or a lead or a sale or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but what that means is in today's world is you really have to be good at web design. You have to know what's going on on your website to have a chance to rank on Google anymore. So by default, we had to kind of become web designers, even though I think my initial interest in getting into digital marketing was really more about Google. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, look, um, duct tape marketing, of uh, that's definitely well known. Yeah, um, and how that worked is it's funny because I am, um, you know, my backgrounds. Um, I'm, I'm basically I consider myself an outsider. Okay, mm -hmm. I I went to school and got a degree in finance. Yep. Um, my first job out of school was with an insurance company, mm -hmm. um, and it was really because it just they just so happened to be hiring entry level people. So I they started working for three years um, in this uh, insurance job, and it was one of these things where it was like a beige you know building beige carpet that was in a cubicle uh, probably wearing beige pants and I think by the third year I started to feel a little bit like a zombie and my soul was getting crushed a little bit and I started yeah. looking at the guys around me that had been there for a couple you know two three decades and I was like wow I just kind of felt my life getting pulled into a direction that it felt like I didn't really choose uh, and then you start making some money and getting some comfort. Again, I was out of school, so the money I was making was like, I'm so happy I have a job and yeah. be doing this kind of stuff. But then all of a sudden, you kind of get to be, you get to be pulled in directions where you didn't. Yeah, you know, it's not like I went to school, you know, dreaming to be about an insurance person, <laughs> um, and not not to knock that no, business or anybody, but it's just one of those things. So I actually um, said, hey, I have got to make a major change here because um, otherwise, I'm gonna you know start doing something that I didn't I didn't necessarily choose. I just knew right then that that wasn't my passion so I essentially packed up my bags and moved to Taipei Taiwan of all places oh, wow. really because I wanted to experience something different I really wanted to learn a new language and get involved in international business and I, I wanted to go to China but this is going back like 20 years ago or so, <laughs> so um, it was way you know, not nearly as advanced They've of course come a long way in the last couple of decades yeah you know be, becoming a wealthy place with some nice and big cities back then it really wasn't like that so taiwan's a great place because they speak mandarin chinese and um, a lot of international commerce and it was a very it was just a nice place to be able to go and study chinese that's what i ended up doing i, I went and i studied chinese i went back to graduate school in the states I got a job right out of grad school that actually took me back to Taiwan. I ended up kind of being in this little, in the in the venture capital, um, you know, IPO, uh, the dot com era, so to speak. When we were just, I was working for a company out there that was bringing um, U.S. companies, North American companies, to Asia to help them find strategic venture capital and strategic partnerships and that kind of stuff. So that was a great. It ended up working out really well, right? I saw myself coming out of school and I, this wasn't it. Then I went to do something you know different. Yep. Um, and it really pretty much put me on the path of where I am today. But it was great because I lived in Taiwan for, for 10 years. You know, I met my wife um, early on there. Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening, what, what ended up happening, what got me into kind of web design SEO was the dot-com bubble, you know, burst, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then for a variety of different reasons, I ended up having a software company kind of just fall into my lap. And they were a company out of, out of the States. Um, the actual name of the company was DVDX Copy, and they sold this consumer software product. Mm -hmm. um, did really well in the states. I think they had like a hundred or two hundred million dollars in sales or something insane the last year of their business. But uh, 
at Hollywood Studios ended up coming to shut them down because there were some issues with me you know, copying DVD <laughs> movies back then. Um, but what ended up happening is they, you know, I was working with them with that company and helping them with an Asia, with Asia. And when they shut them down in the U.S., this this software was still legally sold under fair use rights around the world. Mm. And I just so happened to be in Taiwan and we had an operation going there. So it was at that time when I was running this kind of spinoff operation in Taiwan, again, a software business, yeah. uh, we were selling retail around the world. But most of our sales were coming through these online affiliate relationships through like the precursors to blogs and oh, yeah. the people that are running like online communities and forums and this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And we were paying these guys affiliate commissions for folks that would come through the, you know, the banner ads and the big guys, we'd pay 50 percent um, of a sale. So you, yeah. we were just going back 15 years ago, we were paying guys, you know, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars a month. They were probably working an hour a day, you know, managing these websites. And I was like at that time. Again, I didn't. I came. I was a finance guy. Didn't know much about software. Um, you know, happened to be, I guess, okay and run this business, being at the at the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. And I had I had an IT guy that was kind of the SEO guy. Cause we didn't we didn't call it SEO back then. And I had a graphics design guy, and he was they, they were trying to figure out what SEO was. Nobody really knew what it was. Cause I was just like, what's happening? Google was <laughs> up there, and you know, people are searching for it. They're finding it. How do we get our own website up there? So it was really kind of back then that I was trying to kind of dig dig around and figure out what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, we ended up selling that business out and exiting it and we moved back to the states but it was really at that time that software company that i worked for for a short period of time where i saw the power you know of google and that they were driving a lot of these um these purchase decisions even back, again this is going back more than 15 years ago yeah moved back to the states um uh, 2005 uh kind of just trust trying to find my way figure out what we were going to do it was a nice payday when we sold that company but it wasn't like you know go buy yourself an island type of a thing <laughs> uh, but what ended up happening is I, I did this one little dinky one page uh you know microsoft front page website for an auto detailer that i happened to buy a cheesy little um uh, you know stick shift car because i've been living in asia for a long time and didn't have a chance <laughs> to like, you know, drive around much so i was like oh, cool i'm gonna drive a 350z for a little bit but I, had to, I met this auto detailer who was just kind of in this back you know shop didn't yeah. have a website i was like dude you have to get a website and instead of getting 25 dollars a car from the dealers that you're just trying to do to prep them for sale you could you could be selling um, website, or you could be selling uh, details, you know, full auto details for maybe 100 or 200 dollars. Got his website up in no time. He was ranked. All of a sudden, you know, he's basically comes to me and says, "Hey, Phil, this has changed my business. It's changed my life." Um, it was at that moment I knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I was mm -hmm. like, I can make money off of this thing, and this guy's like looking at me like I'm wow. I really helped him, made a difference in his life. It was really one of the most rewarding things that I've ever had professionally of course we've done it many times over but that's really what kind of got me onto the hook yep. and um got my passion got me fired up about okay i'm really going to figure out what web designs are really figure out what's driving google but it really at the end of the day came back to to web design and that's kind of where i've been um, focusing on the last 10 years it's really coming through um just the way you're talking about it you know the the passion is absolutely there can i just spin back around to uh when you were living overseas did the travel component have an impact on your, I guess, your perspective of business? Was it different or difficult to do business elsewhere and to come into this space? Or did they have, you know, was the cultural uh, impact of your, your travel a positive thing for your business? Um, very much so, because I, I don't know. I, um, for some reason, when I got out of school, I developed some type of anxiety about just being in the professional world so mm -hmm. it got really bad it got to the point where i felt like i couldn't get in meetings without like getting breaking in a sweat oh. and i would, couldn't even like almost talk to people so it got it just really bad and i felt like i could understand stuff but for some reason that I, anxiety was probably maybe lower self-esteem or lack of confidence in being in the business world or something like that mm -hmm. um, but what ended up happening is when i made this change i figured out my life's not in the right place and that's what i want to do when i went and packed up my bags and went into a new country a new culture mm -hmm. uh, and then found a way to um i guess survive or adapt yeah um for some reason it was through that travel and doing stuff completely on my own without a safety net I really all of a sudden felt like I gained a ton of confidence. Yep. 
and I stopped worrying, I guess, so much about what people thought about me for some reason, really because I was in a new culture and I was like, geez, it kind of it set me free because you got you break these like cultural um, shackles that are on you because you're so worried about what the other folks are thinking, about, at least how I was at some point judging mm -hmm. myself against like maybe other people. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that was a source of anxiety. I'm not sure. But when I went into this other culture, which to me was like full, full on culture shock, um, People don't really understand you culturally. You have to adapt and understand the history of people, understand their language. I think a little bit, um, because otherwise it doesn't. You're, you're there, and they don't. There's just this disconnect. So for some for some reason, some way in, in working in there, um, again, kind of jumping into a new a new part of my life without a safety net, and, and kind of making a life for myself somewhere that was totally foreign, um, really built my confidence up all the way around. I think that part of the traveling. Um, and I guess it's more of a personal thing than saying, hey, I did this and I learned this because, you know, certain a different way. The other thing I think that really helped out is I think I developed what I would consider almost kind of like the, an Asian work ethic, okay. which is um, guys. I mean, you're the, they're just working all the time I mean, you're doing stuff and doing deals more like there in the nighttime. And it just seems like it's always going and bustling yeah. um, where we're in the States. Anyway, a lot of things just seem to kind of shut down at five or six a lot. <laughs> um, and there's just this mentality, I think, where and that's changed a lot. I think with the gig economy and people trying to do other things and, and start other businesses, it kind of feels like it's getting more how I felt it was, you know, living living in Taiwan and doing business um, in other parts of Asia. Um, but I think that really, really helped me out, too, because I'm, I'm basically almost kind of still living that lifestyle where I'm happy what I'm doing. I'm, I'm like working kind of like you know, right now in a way this late at night, but I'm, it gets me pumped. It gets my blood flowing. Yeah. You know, my passion. I like talking about it. So you get up and start doing this stuff. So that part, I think, really did help me in a way um, grow as a person that I may never have gotten if I would have stuck along in a comfortable cubicle job um, like a lot of my friends, you know, had yeah. done at college. So, yeah. So this this reinvention of yourself and this uh, this need to I guess work hard and, and and do the hours when necessary, but it seems to me that you uh, value living life and looking after yourself and uh, self reflection. Would you agree with that? I I totally agree, but I also think um, it's just different when you're when you're working and you're not passionate about what you're doing i mean the days get so long oh, and you're yeah. the clock and you're miserable and you're just like how oh, gosh this whereas if you're doing something like i'm a, I, i'm happy to get up at like five in the morning and every day is kind of of course there's certain things in the business that are always going to be a grind and maybe i'm less um excited about yeah but in general every day in some ways almost kind of feels like christmas i mean that, that's the way that i always kind of you know it's a sweet spot, it's just that it? kind of it is. It is. And I never, looking back at myself, I was like, geez, there's just been times when I was like, holy cow, this is miserable for me. Um, and it could be anything, right? It's just, you, once, but once you figure that what that thing is and, and it makes you passionate, you're passionate about it, it really, um, it really makes long days not seem like long days because you're kind of doing what you like. Uh, Absolutely. And that's kind of where I found myself. Phil, I, the, the focus of my future business is to help um, uh, business owners create business systems and, and change their way of thinking about business. I'm looking at a, at your bio and looking at your websites uh, prior to the call and there's a lot we could talk about. Could, could we just touch on systems within your own business and how you, you manage your business overall? Do you have systems? I think I do have systems um, in place and what I found is that I'm very systematic about the parts that I'm passionate about. Right, yeah. And I'm a little less systematic about the ones that um, I'm not. And it's really interesting because it's in the last few weeks that I've really tried to look um, into my own business to kind of figure out, okay, I know, you know, I think no matter where you get in the business, you have some success. You know, you get to a point to be like, can I do better? Can I scale it? Do I want to scale it? Um, cause I feel like myself, I've, I've got a small team of six people, mm -hmm. uh, but I still in a lot of ways feel like I run it like a solopreneur, yeah. <laughs> um, because, but I do have, you know, the parts again that I'm passionate about getting like the website set up the, the way I think is the right way to get them, um, to, to populate them and integrate them in a way that Google will like, and, and to really work on the things that help people on the lead generation. I mean, that's really where... I think my passion is, um, but I look back and I say, geez, you know, I really don't like my, the way I go through the sales process is a little cowboy. 
Um, and I think probably on the back end, I could probably use some improvement in those kind of areas. Mm -hmm. But I think I'm very, like I said, I guess, I guess I don't know if that's kind of a, a non-answer, but no, I felt I've become very systematic in the things that I really want to establish myself as an expert in. Yeah. And the other parts that are less interesting, I'm probably have been less systematic about. And I, I personally have to change that in order, I think, to break through some to grow. Um, and I've really just come to that realization this year. Um, but, but yeah, yeah, I look at, I, I, you know, I look at, uh, the range of products and services that you're providing and it's, uh, very impressive. You know, you, we have, we're looking at web design and I guess that's the look and feel of the website. Is that right? Well, I, you know, our process really is to try and set the website up in a way that, that Google's going to like and really managing the balance between, okay, it's got to be look professional. And, and to us, again, our, and people don't like to hear this, I think, in, 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 my, in the space that we're in in terms of pure web design, pure graphic design. But, you know, our pitch to clients usually is, hey, web design, the graphic parts of this stuff in the business is actually a commodity. Mm -hmm. Right? Because that you could, there's, there is no real like um, specific set of pixels that you need um, to get an arrangement to, to, to maximize, you know, the, the ROI of the project. There's a thousand different ways you can design a website yep. uh, that'll still look good. As long as you got the right content and the right pieces integrated, they could be equally successful. But you get a lot of people, especially business owners, they focus on that front end because that's the part that they understand, right? And the one that they get kind of emotionally tied to. Yeah. Uh, but when we talk about Google and lead generation and conversion optimization, I mean, there's some specific things you have to lay out on the website to have a chance to get that. And a lot of times you need to manage the balance mm -hmm. between what you want to see as, from an artistic level and maybe a corporate identity level versus what you need to show um, Google to prove that you are the best you know, search result or the best page for that for that query or, or what have you. So. Um, there are a lot of things I think that go into web design. And for us, I think the biggest thing is what ends up happening. We've got a chapter in the book actually that's called, I think it's the most popular one that we have, at least in terms of questions. It's chapter five and it's, it's titled, um, why do 99% of new websites fail? And the reason is because most people treat them as digital brochures, right? They go, yeah. they think of them as artwork or they, they think they got a captive audience and I'm going to build the website and say things the way I want to say them. Mm -hmm. And then they work with a web design firm that traditionally are going to be more front end focused and they're, they're more focused on maybe the artwork and the functionality, not so much on the lead generation or the ROI or the other things that really kind of, I think, make a difference in terms of helping businesses grow. But that's just the way the business is. I mean, here in the States on TV, we've got companies like GoDaddy and Wix and Weebly that are you know brainwashing business owners into thinking they can spend $25, $50 a month for a nice looking website and they're going to rank them on Google and that's really all that they need. So it kind of makes people think of them, I think, more as, a, as an expense and not as an investment or something that needs to be tied in. But really, I think what websites have evolved into as they're really like marketing platforms, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they're places where you should be putting all your best content. It should be the referral source for everything that you're doing and there should be some more thought put into the way that they're architected and engineered so that you draw people in and you can pixel and tag them and track them and set up some things of conversion so that they can sell for you while you're not online, all these types of things. But more importantly, I think the biggest part of the way we design websites is you want to treat them and that exercise um, as more of a, a full on holistic you know, marketing endeavor. Meaning the, one of the biggest things that we do, we focus on is really trying to understand the keyword research and the way ideal customers are searching for the products and services that a business is trying to sell. Mm -hmm. This is really key because if you can get into the mind of your ideal customers and figure out how they search for things, you can then start to figure out how you can structure your website and even down to like how many pages and what kind of pages that you need um, to build it from the ground up versus what ends up happening is again, a lot of business owners will go shop for web design, they'll put together a website and put it out there and if they do anything, they'll quote unquote try and do SEO on it later. Well, that's doing it after the fact. Yeah, the perfect time to start working on, on, your, on your website is after you've you know, thought about your marketing strategy, thought about your keyword research and started to bake that in um, to your website plans from the beginning and not as an afterthought. Like a, and that's it, our whole it, process is, and that's really the reasons how we get a lot of results is because there's a big competitive, competitive advantage to thinking about these things ahead of time and implementing into the design and the development of the website and then the content marketing plan versus doing them as an afterthought. It seems um, to me that it's important for 
your business to get in early then so that you can save them a lot of time, heartache and hassle to rework these things. I suspect you see a lot of that. Big time. I mean, that's kind of what was one of the big motivations for the book is that we every single week here in Kansas City, um, we get calls from folks that um, that have just done their websites and we have to tell them, well, in some cases, we've got to redesign it from scratch and others. It's just more expensive to go through the process of building it because they aren't getting the results. Right. And that's because that's what ends up happening is I think business owners are starting to understand that um, or they're starting to kind of. I think in general, they're starting to, to put some accountability on the website. So what ends up happening is they build the websites and there's some expectation that you build and launch a new website that it's going to help your business. And again, this is kind of getting back a little bit into business owners, but um, one, of the, one of the things that we see, because we, we try and rank for our own services um, here, here in Kansas City, one of the things that I can see is most people aren't searching for what they really need, which is kind of a holistic marketing plan. Right. And a, yeah. and, and a strategy and then building tactics in that fill, fill a whole a whole strategy. What they do is they search for tactical pain points. Right. Mm-hmm. They want they say, oh, my our phone's not ringing anymore. So let me try this SEO or let me try this PPC or maybe we can get a social media person or the biggest one of all is usually web design. That's where most of our leads come in, even for digital uh, ongoing digital marketing work is people start and they figure, you know what, our business is flat this year. We need a new website. Well, what they really need is a, is, a, is a marketing plan that's got a digital focus and is all tied together, right? But they start with a website because they just think of, okay, we're not, you know, let's just start there because we know we need help. So yeah, yeah, I think that's really kind of where the biggest um, point is on that. But yeah. One of the uh, things that is of interest to me is the, you know, your, your, your traditional, let's call them traditional bricks and mortar style businesses um, who want to make that transition uh, into the digital space. Do you... Do you have a, a large presence helping uh, that type of business come online? We do more and more because I think what's what's ended up happening the last you know twelve to twenty four months is you can just see the the um, the older generation I guess of, of of business owners that have invested in like the, some of the traditional outbound things and they just they just know or they can see that it's not working like it used to right yeah. So they know, I mean, the phone books are gone, but they still try and do print. Maybe they'll try and do TV or radio or some other form of outbound. And they just see that the, the, that the you know, it's just not working the way it used to. So they almost kind of get forced in to some kind of digital marketing. Now, of course, what ends up happening there a lot is there's a lot of snake oil and think people making promises. And, and you know, especially when it comes into SEO, yeah. uh, I think a lot of these guys will dip their. So they, these, a lot of these guys that are trying to like dip their toe or figure it out, they're getting hit from two sides, right? They're like, they know the traditional the old forms of marketing aren't working like they used to and they know some of the things that they've tried because maybe they tried to dip their feet in it or haven't like researched it well enough or or, or, or you know done their due diligence and end up getting, getting kind of um, burned on it but we see this quite a bit but I, I tell people all the time the problem is I still think and I look at marketing in two ways right now I think of it in terms of um, kind of the, the older outbound marketing, which to me is a little bit more about demand creation, right? Somebody's always got to be out there and creating the demand yeah. and getting people thinking about it and creating sales that aren't there because people getting people thinking about stuff. But really what ends up happening is nobody goes from the TV or the radio directly to the phone call for a sale or the email, right? They see it on TV and they think about it and then they run to the internet and do their research and figure out who's coming up first on Google or who's got the good reviews or there's this little piece of the internet piece that gets in there. So, so I think what ends up happening, at least here, that I see like even specifically in Kansas City is we'll see people do a big advertising push and yeah. it's great because they'll create the demand, but they don't catch their own demand when it filters back on the internet. And what I mean by that is they've got a terrible website or no website. They've neglected their online reviews. So ABC Company does a great TV ad, and they, they you go online, you see they've got like two one-star reviews, and the rest of them are terrible, right? So, and that they're just not in a position to catch the demand that they just spent money on. So what they end up doing is they drive it in that demand into their competitors who have great-looking websites and a lot of online testimonials and reviews. And when they say, well, it's not working, well, I think it's working, but you got to have both sides of the coin in order to be able to have a full, you know, marketing piece. Otherwise, you're just helping out your competitors yeah. and when I when I, we phrase frame it like that they kind of get what we're talking about because I think a lot of people for some reason when 
when you talk to them as a, a business owner or a business person as a business owner, sometimes they don't think of it that way. But if you explain it to them, like how do they, I mean, what do you do when you go to Amazon or when you want to look to a new restaurant or go to a new hotel? Do you ever do online searches or check the reviews and that kind of stuff? Sure, we do that. That's all we do. We go, you know, we go, Google's like the one common denominator. Not everybody might be on Facebook or does all this stuff, but pretty much everybody uses Google for something um, in most places, you know, around the world. So that, that I think that really ends up being kind of a wake up call for folks. Yeah, definitely. But we're really seeing it. And the other point I, that really drives, I think, drives it home is I'm seeing a lot of people like snark at the um, the millennial business owners, but I don't look at it that way. I see some of these young, ambitious people, the guys and girls that are coming up, creating their own businesses. Mm-hmm. They don't know anything but the Internet. So they're like genetically engineered to be awesome digital marketers. You start talking to them about TV and a traditional outbound cold calling. They're just like, that's not how we buy we want a website. We want social media. You know what I mean? They're just like yeah. already locked. Yeah. They're already locked in. Like, that's just the way they, they were like raised. They're so these wide. guys coming in, we've got young people in their late 20s that are stealing large chunks of market share around from their competitors, the guys that are in you know, the 50s and 60s and still dipping their toes in digital. And for some of them, it's almost becoming, you know, a little bit too late. So Yeah, well, there's a big takeaway in this call is to, uh, for, for our listeners who are thinking about making the transition uh in any way shape or form to the digital landscape there there it is straight from the horse's mouth so to speak that you know if you're where are you if you're not online phil it's it's just any of this anymore isn't it don't we all kind of look at that thing as the um it's just it's like i was um, i was on another call the other day and I, i just for myself i went to go look at the the companies with the largest market caps in the world Mm -hmm. so i pulled up the dow and there's a website called the the dogs of the dow i think it is or something like that or Mm -hmm. it's just one that that happens to pull up the on a daily basis it goes and shows you what the top you know most valuable companies in the world are at least in the state and the top five (laughs) that were up there number one is apple number two was google um, I think number three is Amazon, number four is Microsoft, and number five was Facebook. Wow, the giants. Tell me, and the giants, but I mean, all those to me represent the devices that we look for stuff on. It's the computers, you know, and it's the it's the cell phones and all those things, and it's the way we consume the digital content. Every single one of those has to do with, to me, you know, websites and, and devices in this digital space, right? Yeah. And I think yeah. that was really telling. It's like, if you want to figure out where you should be focusing especially, you know, your marketing, your business, look at the five companies that are basically at the very top of the market capital value. They all have to do with, you know, with this digital piece of it. So, it's so yeah. I, it's, uh, I heard that uh, recently that if you really want to know where to, uh, for e-commerce business, um, this was particularly focused at, if, if you really want to know where to focus your efforts, look at Amazon because they'll, yes. be, they'll be setting the scene, won't they? You know, then that's a classic example. So I going back a little bit, we, you, you were talking about how we essentially, you know, the older generation of business owners are not closing the loop. They're putting all of this investment, time, money and, you know, energy into into setting up, but they won't close that loop. Is that is that what you're talking about when you talk about in the book, the, the biggest mistake that small business owners are making when it comes to the web or is that is that just part of it? I think that the, one of the, to me, the biggest mistake is really going to be I look at everything as being, you know, web web centric and really the website being the referral source. So for me, I th- I think the biggest mistake that I see is I think business owners don't really incorporate that web presence or think about their website mm. as as a way of something that they should be putting thought in or, or having at the top of mind on a daily basis. Yeah. Um they still kind of think of it as a side thing or like they had this this digital brochure project, but really you brought up Amazon and my the biggest thing that I think um that people should be focusing on um in terms of bang for the buck is is really trying to use their website as a way to prove that they're the best um, choice for whoever's searching for them. And the way you do that is by showing your track record and using your website to establish 
authority and trust. So we focus a lot less these days on trying to put up a bunch of just jargon or saying, here's what I do. Here's a list of my product and service and the features. Mm -hmm. We put a lot more emphasis on here's the people that I've worked for. Here's the certi here's the here's the things I've I've done to certify or show that I'm an expert. Here's the content that I've you know created. Here's a laundry list of people that say I'm the best at what I do. Because me saying I'm the best is one thing, but 10 other people saying that I'm the best they've ever worked with is a lot different, right? So, I mean, those are the things that make a diff big difference. And I call I I think to me that really comes back to Amazon um, of all of them becoming the Amazon effect because everybody pretty much goes to Amazon and we all, you know, before we make a purchase, most of us, unless we've already known, vetted that product or service and know we want it, we're looking at the reviews, right? So, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's the one thing I think that, and it's no different than anything else. It's like you want a product or service here in local Kansas City. Most people are going to look up, you know, look it up online, see what the reviews are, and that kind of stuff. Um, and I think reviews, they're still, um, I think they're the most important and probably the biggest um, element that you need to have to convert sales. But they're social, also, social in proof. my opinion, go ahead. Social proof. The social proof, and, and the thing I try, try and explain to, to my, my clients is they're super important. We all know that we use them for everything yeah. um, and we uh, purchases, but if you think about them, they're also, they're basically, I mean, they're really rare. Yeah. If you look at an Amazon listing for somebody that's got 500 reviews, well, you think, wow, that's a lot of reviews, but that product probably has tens of thousands of sales. Yeah. They only got a small fractional percentage. So what that means is, we know they're super important. We know they have a huge impact on being able to close a sale, but we also know that they're very hard to get. So what does that mean? It means that we really have to work in a, a very um, solid, this is where it gets into systems. You were talking about systems? Yeah. I think we've developed some really solid systems into helping people um, get, get those reviews in the right places online because more than anything, of course, I'm talking more about like lo maybe local or regional businesses. When we get a business that's got zero reviews and we get them Google rankings and we pair that up with 50 or 100 reviews, that makes the phone ring more than anything else. Hmm. The Google reviews are great, but what ends up happening is people want that social proof more. So you got to find a way to get them in the in the right places that make the big difference. So having a system in, and like I said, the the um, the um, they're hard to get. So you don't just go out and ask somebody for a review anymore. You usually have to go back to them two or three times. You got to have a system. It's got to be easy. You have to be persistent. You have to be tenacious yeah. um, because it takes many, many goes usually to even get one. Because even if you ask somebody that's happy, um, a lot of times they'll say yes and we don't hear back from them, right? So everybody's got kind of a story like that. But once you get them up there and you get them up in the right places, that really has a huge, huge impact. Um, on just about every business, so that's that's I think really important. Yeah, well, I, I'm hearing some you know some classic um, Dan Kennedy style references to social proof and a bit of Jay Abraham's referral systems, and you know in all of that is having a, a systematic way to to make sure as part of your packages feel that this is what you just do, and, and not to consider your website to be some sort of an adjunct or you know an add-on to to your offline business, it, it needs to be an integral part of your overall business. Phil, the SEO for growth that uh, that you wrote uh, with John, I can't say his name, how do you say it? Chance. <laughs> Chance. <laughs> so that's been uh, featured on the likes of, you know, Mashable, Oracle, Entrepreneur, Inc., Huffington Post, and so on. Um, where can people find uh, the book? Well, it's up on it's up on Amazon, but we also have a kind of a standalone book site at SEOforgrowth.com. And right. one of the um, special things that we've done there is we've got a a book page where we've got a nice um, free ebook bundle that has one um, quite a detailed one from the guys at Yoast on website optimization. Oh, yep, yep. I think it's a hundred plus page ebook that they gave us to to bundle with the book. And then we've got another one from Larry Kim of WordStream. And then we've got another one that I co-wrote with another marketing consultant called Local SEO. We bundled those together in a nice little zip. So if you buy the book or if you're a Prime member, you get it for free. You can still come back with the with the code to the website, fill out a little form, and you get that um, that three ebook bundle for free right up there. So that's been pretty popular. So as, long as, as long as I'm waiting for those guys to tell us we can't do it anymore, but <laughs> uh, they haven't said nobody said we can't yet. So oh yeah, I'm, I'm looking at your free one-click SEO analysis. Um, Tell us a bit about how that works for people who would visit your website. 
So, I mean, obviously for, for a company like mine that's in the business, that's a great, being able to have, you know, a website that ranks or has got an inbound, inbound channel, having that um, call to action there that I think is really compelling for people yeah. um, is really important for anybody. So that just having that, I guess, in looking at that is how could I have something like this for my business? Not necessarily a website grader, but whatever it is. I think this is really important these days to, you know, if you spend all this time and money to get somebody to a website, um, you really have to have something compelling to you know get that click or get them on your your subscription list or some way that to be able to uh, um, you know continue that conversation. Yeah. Um, but for us, we've actually given them a people that come on to it. It's a nice way to kind of dip your toes and say, geez, I really haven't thought about my website. I'm going to enter this in here. You know, fill out a couple of my competitors, and it really kind of if you haven't read the book. It helps a little bit to kind of pull the curtains behind the matrix yeah. and see like, wow, okay, I haven't really thought about these things. And there's some really some basic, basic, basic SEO things that most people don't even implement on their websites. So a lot sometimes folks will have if they've got had a website up for a while. Um, if you just take advantage of just a few of the fundamentals mm-hmm. um, on SEO, you can actually um, get lucky and uncork some of that SEO value because you. You know, unknowingly had kind of shut Google off on it for for whatever reason, or hadn't opened it up. So, it's a nice little tool. It's by no means a you know rep, um, would replace a comprehensive audit. Yeah. But um, it does give some actionable things on where to start. It kind of gives you at least a benchmark, like how how am I doing? I haven't really thought about you know my website other than maybe just kind of being a digital brochure or something to publish some stuff up on. So that's a nice little tool to have up there as well. Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, anybody who's just dipping their toes into SEO and internet marketing and uh, considering all of these things. There's lots of moving parts, isn't there, Phil? It really is. Um, but what I love about SEO these days is, you know, I was in a, deep in it for 10 years, and it used to almost exclusively be about tinkering with the, your website under the hood and the content that's on it and doing a lot of off-page backlink building, which is just trying to get third-party websites to link back to yours. Yeah. That would game so, so hard for so long that Google dropped the hammer on it about five years ago. And what they ended up doing, which is what I love, because they've really kind of changed behavior in the way the SEO can, the world has approached SEO, is they've really found ways to go out and grade companies on how well they're doing in a variety of different places. So now Google is able to go out and say, okay, let's measure their social media participation and their signals. Let's see what their reputation management's all about. Are they blogging? Is the content growing naturally with good, you know, good content and being shared? So you almost got this kind of like holistic piece where they're able to go out. And the more you're able to kind of plug your website and integrate that all in a way that Google can can see that you're doing this and get full credit for it. Um, it's it's just a more exciting way to do business, and it really starts to me to make um, Google rankings become much more than just about the rank. And to me, I think they've become a a fundamental marketing KPI. So mm-hmm. seeing rank and organic rank on your content to me is more of an indication that you're doing all these other things right, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's really kind of what the important part about um, SEO is these days is Google's really done a great job of going out and saying, hey, we're not, it doesn't just, you know, I talked to this other guy the other day and they were thinking like, well, you know, we just kind of thought that Google rankings happened like the weather, right? And it's not, it's not like that. <laughs> nice. um, you, you can, if you do things the right way and set it up and, and make it easy for them to crawl and organize your website and do all these other things in a way that plugs them together. Because you see a lot of people that will go out and they'll be like, well, Phil, I've got a website and I spent time on it and I go post on social media. Well, what they end up doing sometimes is they'll post like their best content up on Facebook and it dies there. Yeah. Where they should be posting that up as a blog post and extending that link out to social media and making people come back. So simple things like this. By in, when I say integrating social media and reputation management, all this kind of stuff together, relatively simple things like this where you make your website kind of the referral source and the hub for all these digital marketing things that you're doing can have a huge impact and make a you know, a 1 or 2x return maybe turn into a 5x or a 10x return. And that's really what, to me, you know, SEO is all about. That, in the book, people have read it. And some people have been like, well, this isn't an SEO book. It's a web marketing book. But that's really the point yeah. is it's become more about, you know, integrated digital marketing and just doing it in a way that you got an SEO mindset instead of just hip shooting these things on different directions and not tying them all together. Yeah, and the big takeaway there, Phil, is that we need to look at this as a comprehensive um network of activities that you would take undertake as a small to medium business or even large large businesses for that matter to make sure that your um, you know your touch points throughout the web are comprehensive and uh, and and being measured now 
when I think about Google, I just think of this juggernaut. I can get all my um, statistics from you know different places like their analytics, and you know you can run AdSense and AdWords, and you know you've got their URL shorteners and all these things that they do. What what do you think they're up to at the moment? Where do you think they're going to go with their algorithms? What's next? Do you know if you hark back to the panda days? What what are they up to at the moment? Great, great question. And this is one of the things I think I'm most hot on right now, because it's really kind of changed the way we've our approach to web design. That is, no, and this is what I tell people, and we talked to here in the states too, which is like, no matter what your what you think of has gone on politically, either in the states or in other places, yeah, what's happened to the internet is that it's be, it was already um, not a, tr- a high trustworthy place for a lot of consumers, no. and all of a sudden it became even less trustworthy, right? So you got a bunch of fake news and things being fake, or you've got people being you know hacked. There's a lot of hacking things, and the internet just became a lot less trustworthy than it already was. Mm-hmm. So. So um, that I kind of saw coming right away because I was like, okay, this is really going to make it, you know, people even more skeptical, yeah. you know, websites. Then what ended up happening in February is Google, um, Google has this really interesting document that I think anybody in digital meeting, everybody in digital marketing, I think should read. It's called their quality ratings guidelines. Yeah. And I think now it's a 157 page document, but really what they, what Google and what Google does mm-hmm. is they hire an army of 10,000 people, I'm pretty sure they're, I don't know where they're located, I think they're all remote, but there's 10,000 plus people that they hire for somewhere between 15 and $25 an hour to go out and manually check the results to see what the quality is like. So they don't just go out there, they actually have an army of people that is that are constantly um, manually grading the search results uh, from a quality standpoint from actual humans and not just letting the algorithm go wild, right? Wow. And really important piece there, right? Because yeah. it's like they're actually saying, okay, we're, we're having this human test and we're paying people for it. Hmm. So that document has always been fascinating to me because it's like, gosh, if they're going to tell you anything about that, it's between the lines in this thing, right? Because they're they're using that as a way to grade themselves. So they're and, and they and they've got these details on how to do it. So one of the things that they came through in this in this new revision of the document that they have revised many times is they actually started to talk about um, fake news yeah. and trust yeah. and education and authority and all these things. Where I was like, holy cow! And they give you specific examples of the types of websites that are high trust and low and low trust. And if you start reading through this, all of a sudden you're just like, okay, geez, I know what I have to do on a website now, yeah, right? Yeah. I have to look at myself as a quality rater and what can I put on my website that's going to establish me as an expert in 20 or 30 seconds as I roll down the screen. Well, geez, a video of you talking or you having, you know, BBB or some kind of certifications or listing and all that, you've got actual testimonials or all these things that make you look like a real business versus, you know, some of these guys that'll just put up, you know, text about their services and there's no faces and this kind of stuff. Really great and really, I think, interesting information. I think something that to me um, changed the way we kind of focused on how I really even look at websites. I already kind of did some of this before, but now I look at websites even differently this year and that I almost kind of think of them of them as a as a live court case where the jury's the client and you're basically trying to prove to them and put the evidence out. <laughs> yeah, it's um, a bit like that, isn't it? Yeah. To make the case. Because at the end of the day, if you're you know, our attention spans are like eight or ten seconds or whatever I read here recently. Mm-hmm. You you gotta put it out there really quickly. And the people that are looking for stuff these days, they just want the guy or the girl or the product or the service. They want somebody to make it so easy for them that it's the no-brainer choice. And you can do that with a website. You can do that by stacking the deck in the right way, you know what I mean, and putting the right information out and yeah. not worrying so much about, well, we got to tell everybody about all the things that we do. No, no, no. You can actually do that a little bit later or maybe just summarize it, you know what I mean? Yeah. What you need to do is get the social proof in the right place so that people – trust you immediately and there's like geez all these other people said you were the one and they gave all these reasons and they're vouching for you in these places in these different ways you know by way of showing your portfolio and all these kind of things that's what really i think makes a big difference one for closing people but we can see that google's actually looking for this kind of stuff to rank you so that's that to me is kind of one of the bigger takeaways of this year and really why how we're how we're kind of focusing on these things and also why i think i I tend to like beat the dead horse on reviews and testimonials. Yeah, I, think no, they, I, I understand why. It's it's about that authenticity, isn't it? That uh, you're talking about this quality score, and uh, you know, thank you for revealing that insight for the audience. I'm sure that's a a massive takeaway is to understand that you know, if you're going to put content out there, don't 
make sure you don't put out rubbish is essentially what we're talking about. Exactly. So and and, and yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean that's that's exactly it. And don't be afraid to um, to put yourself out there a little bit. You know, talk. You know, show who you are. Use. I mean, all the things that are out there. You know, put your physical. If you got an office, I mean, put the physical address out. Um, don't be putting content out to just put content out, but you know, it's, it's much more, I think, important to put quality stuff out there that actually adds value versus just trying to, you know, hit numbers and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, this is, this is the, these are the things I think that are really, uh, moving the needle needle. Um, and also really just finding a way to record. I mean, I think a lot of times people have lots of great information and many, many happy customers, but you would never know by looking at their website. You know what I mean? So just finding, again, maybe a system in place to make sure that you're harvesting all this good stuff that's coming, you know, maybe your, your business on a weekly basis and documenting it in a way that, you know, people can see that so that they can, you know, choose you basically, I think is really important. And differentiate yourself. Look, you talked about quality. This has been a quality call. I've had a really great time um, speaking with you, Phil. In fact, I'd love to uh, invite you back because I don't really think we've um, taken too much of a deep dive into internet marketing, which I know is a passion of yours. I know that uh, you know lead generation is a, a big thing for you and it's a skill set that I know you want to talk about. How about uh, we, we catch up again soon? Would love to. Excellent, Phil. Thank you again. And for everyone who is looking for uh, your services, tell them where they can find you. Well, SEOforgrowth.com is kind of where we wrote the book and, you know, John and I kind of, you know, packed together yep. everything that we, we knew in that piece. So that's a great place. But if you wanted to see how kind of I run my business, again, we service most people in Kansas City or in the Midwest region of the States. But um, I've got uh, my SEO services website is at KCSEOPro.com. And I got a little website called KCWebDesigner.com, which is kind of where it all started. Um, we're actually relaunching that one pretty soon. But again, you know, locally focused stuff. But it gives you kind of a taste of you know, the things that we're doing. And, and you'll see, um, if anybody sees the site the way it is right now and how we're relaunching it, you'll see a lot of what we talked about in terms of um, – you know, trying to put that social proof up, making that kind of a bigger uh, part of what's up there is going to going to change for us here pretty soon. So those that's real. And I do like to I'm I'm most active on LinkedIn, so it yep. just happens to be my favorite place of choice. So anybody's always welcome to uh, to contact me up through through LinkedIn as well. Okay, Phil. Look, what what I'll do is I'll put it put together a write up and uh, some links to. Um, those particular URLs. Thanks, Rick. Not a worry. So uh, I will catch up with you again soon. And thanks, everybody, for listening. I had a blast. Thank you.